Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your 4K guap TV Zay bop of weekly cultural review. I'm John Caramonica, critic of the New York Times. I'm Joe Coscarelli. I'm a reporter at the New York Times. Before we jump into things, though, we have to remind everybody, here we are, two grown men on YouTube, youtube.com slash popcast. Subscribe, like, we are here every week with a new episode, and also the audio episodes are uploaded to the channel. Um, yeah, like and subscribe. Get in the comments. We'll respond. I'll respond. Yeah, I was going to, we, that's extremely strong we. <laughs> Um, there are a couple. First of all, I appreciate people who take note of the outfits. I appreciate people who take note of the chairs. And I appreciate people who take note of the lore. So just know we're watching. Uh, so it's youtube.com slash popcast. Get involved. It's back to school. It is back to school. It's back to school. I don't, I, I got to be honest. I don't feel great to be back at school. I feel great to be here. This is like if we're ever going to go to school, this is the school that we want to go to. Recess. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. Like us walking through the hallways talking about Lil Wayne verses. Uh, so we're back at school. Um, I want to say it is. It, it was a slightly slow week in culture last week. There is some sort of like B-list television and B-list films that we were thinking about talking about but we're not going to talk about. Because the thing that I think we're most kind of provoked by was – I guess loosely triggered by a conversation on Twitter prompted by the Andre 3000 album. Which you discussed. I did on, on original recipe podcast. Shout out Zach, shout out Sadie. Very good episode. Got good feedback on that episode. It's an ambient episode. It is. It actually is like low key an ambient episode. Um, in the interview that Andre did with Zach for GQ, Zach sort of is pushing him on why he's not rapping. And Andre's like, well, what am I going to rap about? Like, I'm 48, 48, right? Something like that. Uh, he's like, what am I going to rap about? Like, my eyesight's not great. Like, colonoscopy. I'm 48 years old, and not, not to say that age is a thing that dictates what you rap about, but in a, in a way it does. And, like, the things that happen in my life, like, what are you talking, like, I got to go get a, a colonoscopy? Like, what do you... <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you rap about? You know what I mean? Like, my eyesight, my eyesight is going bad. Like, so now, of course, Andre 3000, one of the great rappers of all time, technicians, uh, one of the great creative idea generators, one of the people who fundamentally broke the idea of what hip hop was supposed to be in the early to mid 2000s. And, and almost all of us are living in the shadow of that, knowingly or otherwise. But it did sort of bring up the question, like, what is middle-aged rap sound like? And this is something we've touched on before. I was talking to Karen, actually, earlier, talking about Jay-Z, and she said, I, I will never forget running the photo of Jay-Z on the water ski, like, on some piece I wrote X amount of years ago. About whether Jay was too old to Yeah, rap. something along those lines. <laughs> and she's like, that's seared in my brain. Uh, maybe, maybe we could find that photo and throw it up here. Um, but Andre says, in essence, I have nothing to rap about. I shouldn't be rapping. That's not, that's not what rap is for. Now, I happen to think that's wrong. Hmm. Um, I happen to think it's right. I know. You mentioned. Um, maybe start with why you think it's right. Music is for young people. Music is... Oh. <laughs> yeah, see you, John. <laughs> I'm aging out. Look, I'm aging out. I'm like, maybe... <laughs> Bye, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Sit down. What? <laughs> Not accurate. Uh, I'm I'm being a little I'm being a little bit glib, but I do think music, unlike most other art forms, <laughs> this is a this is a take that I've had at the bar for many years yeah. and that I stand by. There is no musician in history, in popular music, who's yeah. later. You want to get like, yeah? I'm not. And I don't want to hear from Zach Wolf on this. <laughs> I just don't. Um, I don't know anything about classical music. Yeah. There's no musician whose later career music is better than their early career music. And I don't feel this way about writers, novelists. I don't feel this way about film I directors. I, I don't feel this way about I actors. I wish I had prepped for this. I'm sure there's an I'm there sure. is no. There is no. I'm sure there's a counter argument. There is no answer. Like there is, I mean, I've heard Tom Petty, you know. Never heard of him. Uh, I've heard, shout out to Teddy. He, he gave me that one once. Um, I've heard, you know, some people would say Dylan. But it's like, yeah. so you can like stuff. Okay, and this is how I feel about old rappers. This is how I feel when I listen to... Two Chains and Lil Wayne on Welcome yep. to Collar Grove, mm -hmm. the new edition of their mixtape, which we can talk about. Yep. It's how I feel when I listen to Rick Ross and Meek Mill yep. also have a 
album out together, you know. That's how I feel. Collaboration albums. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, old people, they need a crutch. (laughs) Literally. literally That is actually not why that's happening, but okay, fine. Uh, Go on. It's like the seventh season of a Showtime show. If you're invested... You still might get a nice moment, you know. You you still want your your you want to follow the saga. Same same you thing as being a Drake lore. fan. You believe in the if lore. If you believe in the lore, Fine. you might get a performance where you're like, "Oh, like Wayne sounds really athletic. He almost sounds like when I really loved his music." <laughs> like, but other than that, but, I just I think that it is it's it, it comes down to a little bit of music being id and like you want as little between we've talked about this as but little it, between what you're feeling and what yeah, yeah, what yeah. comes out and to me that is like fundamentally a young person thing well let me ask this like is that not a reflection of your aging more than it is a reflection of the artist's aging because you are not at the place in your life where you have that unfettered access to id that you had when you first engaged so with i want to get when, it from playboy cardi and his children I mean, you want to be maybe near it or you're open to the idea that what Cardi is doing is a rough equivalent for like what Wayne did at a certain point. So like how much of this is actually about artist age? Now look, sidebar, most artists later work, don't bother me with it. No, no, I, I'm not disputing it. Sure. I just think it's not impossible to find grace and elegance and a different path towards beauty in a different phase of life that a young person could appreciate an older artist's music or an age appropriate. I mean, this is, I mean, we sort of talked a little bit about like Griselda and stuff. And it's like a lot, I feel like a lot of like, (laughs) I was thinking a lot about this when I had satellite radio for that one month, Mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago, there's like a shade 45 type rap fan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like real, like bars, 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 like scratch magazine alum type energy with respect. Like those are all my friends. Uh, that kind of person, I think, like, is excited about, like, the sixth album from some artists who, like, raps exactly like they rapped on their fifth or fourth or third or second album because they're seeking to fill a hole that's, like, the exact same size. They're not looking for necessarily innovation. Mm-hmm. Um, they're looking for things that retell a familiar narrative. But I think, for me, when I'm looking at younger artists, I'm looking for things that are novel or unexpected. But even when I'm listening to older artists, I think it's possible for an older artist to do a thing that is unexpected in the context of their character, in the context of their ongoing work. I mean, this is where the Jay-Z 444 conversation comes in. Great album. Really, really good album. I don't know if I love it as much as like in the moment where you're like, I can't believe he did this. And then like maybe three months later, you're like, Mm, okay, how often do I go back to this? And album? yet, it's like the gold standard for album by old people. But if Andre, here's the thing, Andre up look, there with like Leonard Cohen and Johnny Cash. Andre, here's the thing: wants to rap, great; doesn't want to rap, great. It's not our problem. Like, it's whatever choice is fine. I think if he found a path to a rap album or an album with rapping on it at this age on whatever subject matter he felt was right. I'm willing to bet that we would feel about that album very similar to how people felt about 444. I agree. And I also think the thing that um, I think Tyler said to me about Pharrell on the Louis Vuitton story, but also said to Andre, um, maybe it's in it's in one of the Andre interviews. I don't know if it's in the GQ or maybe the Guardian. Tyler, the creator. Tyler, the creator, sorry. And he says, like, you basically – innovating and trying things and going in unexpected directions let us know the full range of future opportunities available to us and my only frustration with andre saying like rap is not it obviously it doesn't have to be you know like podcasting doesn't have to be it for us you know it's like people can grow and change and evolve people can grow and change and evolve but the notion that rap as a form could not accommodate some kind of evolutionary step, subject matter-wise, flow-wise, texture-wise, that to me seems wrong. And I think there are people who still work, and if they're uh, chipping away at like a very familiar thing that they do, but they still do it at an advanced age, that's fine. But there are people who probably are also trying new things. And I, I thought if anybody would be a person who's like, rap is limitless, rap can do anything, you would expect it to be Andre. But... 
Yeah, but flute. Here we are. Look, I think form-wise, sure. Any like you can talk about anything you want in rap, but typically what we're drawn to are stories of come up, stories of struggle, stories of it's circumstantial. No, nah, I don't think so, but because it's been that way for fifty years. But now. that's you. But again, that's again. I think you're looking at young music made by young people for young listeners. But that doesn't mean that you can't arrive at middle-aged music made in a slightly more uh, progressive mean for middle-aged listeners or, God forbid, the elderly. Look, I think that that is fine. I'm just saying it doesn't really exist. And, like, if we're still waiting for Andre to be the one to show us how it's possible, Mm -hmm. okay. But instead, what I think we often get, I was thinking about this a lot in listening to the new Drake songs, the expanded edition of uh, For For All All the the Dogs, Dogs. Scary Scary Hours Hours Edition. edition. Yeah. Uh, Which, like, good rap songs. Great rap songs. Cool rap songs. Really good beats. Really good rapping. Good rapping. Real chip on the shoulder it's, energy. It's great. Like, it's weird. It's, I mean, obviously, they put it on there to, like, bump the album back up on the charts, but it's, like, it is a self-contained, like, those six songs feel like a self-contained idea of, like, a particular idea, a version of Drake. But one of the things that Drake is doing, and it's funny because so much of the conversation that led him to be angry enough to record these songs were, like, why isn't Drake more mature yeah, in yeah, his rapping? Course. But what I find that he's doing is the same thing that I found jay doing which is the same thing i found wayne doing which is the same thing i found eminem doing which is a lot of wordplay as these guys get older Uh, and they have less and less story and less and less lore to tell and even jokes because wayne you know wayne is not necessarily a lore rapper he's a punchline rapper mm -hmm. he's the best punchline rapper but he's mostly Mm -hmm. a punchline rapper. yeah sure very very few story songs uh Mm -hmm. in, in the best of Wayne's no, music. No, just like sila- freaking syllables. But what they get more and more into is like what words mean and how they sound. And you like mean you like see, homophones? Yes, homophones. <laughs> literally. And I've asked, I asked Eminem about this like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I interviewed Eminem and I was like, do you ever like think like maybe you're too into the art of rapping and not into like making songs anymore? Well, like you're you're just like you're just saying ah. words that have different meat. Like you know. And he was basically like, yeah, like that's what. It, and I, when I interviewed him again this year, it was the same thing. He's like, he cares. He's so obsessed with it as a sport and as like technique. A, as technique. Yep. And I find that these older rappers, when they're still good, they're just going deeper and deeper and deeper in technique and not necessarily interested in expanding storytelling wise or narratively that's fair although i think you are talking about a particular class of rappers who were raised on technique and i wonder if that's going to hold from like a certain type of rapper like you know future onward well future's 40 years old right so we're gonna, we we're should, gonna know, get we should this. note yeah. that <laughs> but from future onward who are not sort of like classic technicians in like the shade four or five cents okay you know what i mean like sure. you're talking about those kind of rappers that's different i don't know so okay we were talking about the Billboard rap charts, which are in a very, very unusual place. We talked about the pop charts a couple weeks ago. And we're how they're broken. A- rap yes. charts also, also broke, broken. Also broken. <laughs> and also, I looked on Rap Caviar just to kind of get a sense of what's happening right in this moment. I'm going to run some, can I just put some numbers to you? Yeah, yeah. Gucci Mane, mm-hmm. 43 years old. Mm-hmm. Rick Ross, 47 years old. Lil Wayne. 41 years younger old. <laughs> yeah it's insane been famous like yeah. longer basically as long as we've been alive <laughs> yeah. um, it's only 41 uh two chains 48 and you mentioned the future 40 so like all this kind of like anxiety like oh no andre said that you can't rap over 40 here's five people who are literally like who like what that's not real. But are no. any of them making vital music? What is vi- okay? Uh, let's. What is vital? Okay. So, we both were we were talking about this a few minutes ago. Yeah. Should we play the Wayne verse on the uh, Benny the Butcher song? Yeah. All right. It's the Big Dogs. It's Benny the Butcher. Lil Wayne. the Butcher. I shoot you here, jug you. The mute be on the blucker. That's the Uzi with the shusha. The doobies looking fuller and the jewels be full of boogers. Diamonds cover the watch face like a Sunni in the Muslim. Got the hoochies in the hookers with the booties in the bosom. Snipers like Kevin Durant. Shooters be like Devin Booker. I'm a black supreme. When I listen to that, now, to your point, obviously, I'm familiar with the lore of Lil Wayne. And I'm like, ah, that reminds me sort of like 07 Wayne. Now, I happen to know 07 Wayne. I happen to be there during that time period. I also interviewed Wayne a bunch 
prior to the to the mixtape run. <laughs> How old are you, John? That's <laughs> totally man. We all we all need to look in the mirror. We all need to pull an Andre. Uh, someone should give me a flute before this episode's out. Um, but I listen to this. I still derive thrill from it. Sure. Uh, pleasure. Yeah. Like uh, Shameless season five. It's fine. <laughs> but but also, what's interesting to me is that uh, a song like this, a verse like this, somehow still feels relatively modern. Yeah. And that, I think, is striking when someone can have a style or an innovation that doesn't feel dated. Now, when I listen to some of these future throwaway verses about hooks about Chanel and whatever, whatever, like, these are not timeless. These feel like rehash. They don't feel like of them. To me, they don't feel, except for the, um, how do you say the soccer player's name? Mbappe. <laughs> Mbappe. The Mbappe remix. Yeah, Mbappe good. remix goes. Yeah. That one goes. Hundreds of thousands or more. I'm spinning galore. Popping new diamond for sure. Spinning new money for sure. 680 Maybach for sure. Do what I say, that's for sure. Took margaritas and play by the show for the one I adore. Ain't taking shorts. Part of me Glock will be ready for war. A lot of that stuff feels rehashy to me, but Wayne seems like someone who is managing to maintain a sense of vitality. Uh, and I do think in part that's because of his obsession with rapping as a craft and with the English language, which like more power to him. And I think that's fine, but I am still looking for what you are pres presuming can exist, which is like quote unquote grown man rap. Like I wrote about killer Mike this year. He, he made an album called Michael it's nominated for a Grammy. It's a really good adult rapping. It's a really good adult rapping. Uh, he's, he's mining his family history. You know, he's talking about fatherhood, He's talking about faith. Like, I get it. I just, and same thing with this new Danny Brown album, right? Like, people are obsessed with this idea that Danny Brown is now a mature rapper, which is like just, but again, it's just Danny Brown talking about when he got famous the first time. Like, it's just extending plot for a character you already <laughs> know. And it's not changing my idea of like what rap is or what rap can be. And when I- But if people are tapping out, this is, this is what I'm saying. And this is why the Andre thing to me is frustrating. Because if people are tapping out because they perceive that being of a certain age means you can't participate or shouldn't participate, then the art form itself withers. And this is why, like, during that moment in the early There's 2010s... There's always going to be teenagers, though. There's no, no, no I withering. understand. But during that moment in the early 2010s, when the first Rock Marciano breakout moment, the Ka breakout moment, that was an idea... That was a moment where I was like, ah, here is an idea of rapping and, and presentation of rap music yeah. that I genuinely don't think a young person could have delivered. I agree. That was something that I think you had to have lived a lot of life. You had to have had some losses. You had to have had um, a sense of triumph and failure to come back on the other side with a remade version of what the genre could do. That, to me, that's 444. Four, four. Before yeah, I mean, four, four, Rock Marciano is a good answer and maybe one that undermines my original sort of uh, trolley take that all early music is better than all yeah. late music because he's basically like a crime fiction writer. He's like mm -hmm. Elmore Leonard. You yeah, know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, yeah, which is like, that's cool. And I'm open to that. But even that to me has has a sell by date. And I guess I just wonder, like, I mean, it's certainly not the ever going to be the dominant form of the genre. It's like it's it's no, nostalgia. It like, are you a, are you sitting there listening to these Nas Hip Boy albums? No. Like, because people love these and these get thrown around as who's examples too. Who's That's what I mean. I'm like, but people who love Nas love hearing Nas rap over Hip Boy beats. Any song that I've heard off those albums are like eminently serviceable, like fill in the blank, paint by numbers Nas songs, and that's. Those are still pretty good because Nas is a really good I rapper. Mean. But like but for to, what? No, I, I don't disagree. For Again, the four oh one K. In the big look, in the big picture of the thing for the Grammys, really, yeah. is what yeah. I mean, like that's rap Grammy era. Yeah. Like if ever there was rap Grammy era. But to me, the more albums like that foreclose on the possibility that someone might make an album like a Ka album, like an early Kaum, or like whatever Andre might show up and do. Like I remember being really struck. I mean, this is, I mean, forgive me, but like there was like an extremely random Big Daddy Kane kind of like a live band, like funk album that I thought this was like in 20, early 2010s. And I was like, 
this is legitimately, this is a good album. Now it's an album for older people. Like kids are not going to listen to this record, but it's an interesting evolutionary take on like what, how this guy raps, what kind of music he's in dialogue with. You know, it's like, I mean, you hate to, I, I hate to say it, but it's like, there's a certain style of rapper, especially New York rapper who like once or twice a year will do three nights at the blue note. That's like the bad version of it. But like, to me, like that's like the bad version of what this big daddy came record, even though I did see him do it at the blue note. But um I think there's opportunity. I, I just hate it when people say, like, it reminds me of people dismissing the vast range of potential creativity of the genre as a whole. It reminds me of, like, regional tribalism of people in New York being like there couldn't possibly be stylistic innovations coming from the West Coast or from the South. Um, I feel like I am old enough to have lived through enough frameworks of people being like, hip-hop can't do this. Hip-hop can't do that. Hip-hop can't grow in this way. It can't develop. And... And every time the genre has proven those people wrong, it was very strange to see Andre of all people be like, it's a young man's game. Well, it's interesting and I don't, and I want also that it came from Andre because he still is a good rapper. I was every thinking, guest versus yeah, friend. I was thinking about, you know, friend. when this came out, I was thinking about Ben's friends, like when he appears with Future, that's many, mm -hmm. many years ago, but he's on this Killer Mike album I'm talking about, and he has a verse on the song Scientists and Engineers, yep. which is quite Grammy nominated. profound it's right. like he, the, yeah his line is like i wish i had some scientists and engineer friends that's like that's something that an old person can be rapping about older listeners by and large i think are less curious listeners and the idea that they might want to be challenged in a new and novel way rather than reassured through the lens of nostalgia whether by listening to because i was thinking a lot about like oldies rap radio like k-day or whatever and it's like Where's the rap radio station for middle-aged rappers to just deliver middle Shade 45. <laughs> I mean, you said it. I did say it. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I think I think most rap, you know, people just want to have a certain pleasure center activated. So I think that's part of what's at play, too. But I would hope also as rap fans age and develop, they there may be more openness to a wider range of solutions for the middle-aged rap fan. Let's let's, let's listen. I'd to love a little to listen bit of that. that. Communication coming in. Too much that I can't communicate with all of them. I do wish I had scientists or engineer friends. Let's go. Get out of here. Petro is cheaper than it's ever been. And then, who's to say when art will end? All I know is when the portrait painted better have your portion of the rent. A dollar more and you will get upgraded when you think you've made it. You are then just tolerated, overrated. Hope I'm 80 when I get my second win. Part of the reason we're talking about future and rick ross and meek mill and nas and everybody else we've just wayne yeah and is because no one has taken their place it's weird right it's weird yeah. and there is this vacuum in contemporary hip-hop yeah stardom has it, changed stardom, stardom has changed. changed rap is in many many different little niches and they are not that often working their way back into the mainstream at least this year or for the last couple of years certainly not in the way that things used to happen which or is... even like five six seven years ago. yeah yeah that's what i mean yeah. yeah uh and okay so we're sitting here jack harlow's loving on me which we talked about uh, a couple episodes ago it did make its way to the top of the billboard hot 100 did what it was supposed to do did what it was supposed to do doja cat has some big rap songs this year if I mean, we perceive them as big rap songs. I don't know if the universe perceives them as big rap They are songs. popular songs, and they are also rap rapping, songs. if you listen closely. That's what I'm saying. It's like, they are rap songs. If you, you have to acknowledge that, they are popular. Yes. And then there's this guy, Drake, who we've talked about. He was, you know, one of the people hogging up all the oxygen in our conversation about pop music. Yep. He remains one of the people hogging up all the oxygen when we talk about rap music. Yep. Mm -hmm. But then we did the same thing we did with the pop charts. We took a scroll... Down, down the billboard. Yeah, and I want to, I want to just, I want to just run through some some would, names for you. I would love to hear them. Uh, okay, you got "Loving on Me" by Jack Harlow. You got Doja Cat, SZA, Drake, Gunna, same song all mm -hmm. year. Yep. Uh, you know, you have you have Tyla, Water, Drake, 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 Drake. <laughs> There's only a couple names on here that are not. Yeah, that are not. The obvious, the obvious yeah. Mount Rushmore of contemporary yeah. rap music. Travis Scott is on here with that song "I Know," which is like the fakest of all fake rap hits. Yeah, okay. um, that Dochi track we talked about right. uh, with Kodak. Mm -hmm. 
Nicki Minaj, Barbie Girl. I mean, like all like this remakes. Is, also, like the perniciousness of remakes. Like uh, we are issues. stuck. Yeah, we are stuck. the 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 name on here the most times who is not Drake. It's a guy by the name of Rod Wave. Most popular. The most popular rapper yeah. in America is a singer. Yes, absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, Broadway. I don't love the new album as much as the previous albums. Like the Turks and Caicos song, I really think is not right. Um, that one, that's the one with Twenty One Savage. Yeah, yeah that's on here. Yeah, it's not that good. Girls, 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 girls all over the world. The world. Love, love. She's a real deal diva, mode in a Instagram model. Bad bitches love reposado, drinking out a bottle. I don't use these trash, shoot no shots, but I can pass. Last three Rod Wave albums prior to this, I think, are all like minimum B plus, like some of them A minus and A. Like Rod Wave is, I think, um, a really. I mean, you talk about pain rap to the degree that that's a thing. Young Boy, Rod Wave, etc. Some Dirk, yeah. some Dirk, yeah. Like Rod Wave, I, I obviously is the purest singer out of that group. Um, I think in a lot of the early stuff that I was writing about him, you know, there's a lot of blues. It's like, it feels like as close as you can get to contemporary blues right. uh, is Rod Wave. With like no cap up there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so uh, it's it's weird. I think this album is the one where he's like a little bit more like, what if I made like a slightly more? It's like Mary J. Blige, like making positive records. And people were like, uh, what? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> you uh, consider this a positive Rod Wave album? Well, I mean, it's like <laughs> relatively it's inching in that direction. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think with Rod Wave, like 10 to 20 percent optimism is like that's yeah. inching that direction. Um, but yeah, Rod Wave. Do you Crazy consider pop. Rod Wave a rapper? I haven't. You've considered him a yeah. singer with rap cadences? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. But I, he's a good rap. Like w- when he's putting words together that rhyme like he's very good at it he can flow but i agree it's like 60 40 singer yeah i mean i think his primary mode is melody and i it's not melody in the sense that like young thugs mode is melody i think rod wave is like much more classically attached to like four four structures like i think he's going from the line the way that his syllables move is like much softer it's he's less i think he imposes a cadence onto words rather than imposes words onto a cadence okay which to me is where the line falls so the most popular rod wave song on the charts it's not is it the turks and caicos right now it's not actually that's that's the oh it's great gatsby one it is great gatsby which i think is interesting for two reasons one it's called great gatsby and the conceit is I threw a party, party for everyone, when, but it was only, only for, for you. you. Like that's like that's a good, good li- that's yeah. a good, it's a good idea. Summation of the Great Gatsby. Uh, like, do we think that he's a Fitzgerald guy or a Baz Luhrmann guy? Um, <laughs> or neither. Or a Wikipedia, <laughs> a Wikipedia guy. guy. Yeah, I'd probably movie. I'm gonna go movie. On he, that. he could be a big Leo fan. You could, you could see it. Yeah, you could see it. Uh, <laughs> we, is this where we play the uh, Leo rapping Dwick footage from yeah, TMC? Yes. Leo, talk about sh- first of all, talk about Shade Four Five listeners. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> rapping Dwick as captured by TMZ. Like, definitely Shade 4 5 was playing in the truck on the way back to the house. <laughs> the other thing that I like about Great Gatsby, which I learned on TikTok, is that. you About the book or the movie? <laughs> the, the song. song. <laughs> <laughs> the song. Okay, yeah, go off. Rod Wave likes a sad sample. In yeah. fact, this album, the first voice you hear on this album uh, is, is uh, Kelly Zutrow, uh, a, a mm-hmm. musician and friend of mine from Wet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. A sample from Wet is yeah. like the opening bars on the Rod Wave album, which like I never expected in Did my life. Did it by Kelly, A Home Upstate? I hope so. Yeah. Um, and this one has something similar. So I was like, what is the sample from Weary Gatsby? I didn't recognize it. And it turns out it's a girl who recorded 
as a vocal sample for a potential Rod Wave song. She just re- she like pre it's like a re- type sample. Yeah, it's a type sample. Yeah, it's a Rod Wave type sample. Where where was it? Lo- like where did he find it? I think like they one of her like producers, just, like, one of his producers, them. like sourced like I need a vocal hook that I can like sample and make sad for Rod Wave. Uh, so we'll play a little bit Incredible. of that. Incredible. Yes. Uh, this is like the the they got production down to a science. Absolutely, you know. Um, okay, couple other names on this chart. Sexy Red. I want to talk about the sort of ceiling that we've seemed to run into for what is obviously a very rich and diverse crop of young female, female rappers. rappers. Yeah. Sexy Red, of course, quite raunchy. It's part of the value. Proposition. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the, you know, there's a term for this kind of rap that we're not going to say on the pod. Uh, a, a colloquial shorthand. <laughs> <laughs> DM Joe for more. <laughs> yeah, look, Sexy Red, biggest rapper Lincoln of the year, bio. like biggest rising rapper of the year, maybe. That's, yeah, arguably. Yeah, and yet not that popular. Um, not on the Megan level. Not on the Cardi level. Like not oh, achieving that sort of those those women got crowned quite quickly, and yet for this next generation. We're not really seeing that that's upward mainstream momentum. It's a that's, much slower build. What's that's interesting. That? I don't know if I agree. Certainly not as famous as Cardi. The Megan thing is interesting because I think I would venture to say that's that Sexy Red is more popular than Megan The Stallion. Certainly right now. Fine. And maybe even at peak Megan The Stallion era outside of WAP, which is like a one of one sort of like astronomical thing that like really only happens once in any artist's career. I think there is a social and cultural ubiquity to Megan the Stallion, but not a musical ubiquity to Megan the Stallion. Yes. Whereas Sexy Red is maybe the opposite thing, which is I think there is actually something of a musical ubiquity coming, which is to say, you know, as you predicted many, many, many weeks ago, Ski Yi becoming catchphrase and sports teams and so on and so forth. Obviously, Pound Town, huge viral hit, and I think is informing a tremendous amount of like online sentiment yes. about Sexy Red and awareness. I think so many people are aware of Sexy Red, but Sexy Red is not, I mean, outside of like going on Drake dates and doing, you know, I saw Sexy Red at Irving Plaza recently, very fun show. Sexy Red is also pregnant and like maybe about to go off tour if she hasn't finished tour already to Have give birth and yeah. and take a few months off. Um, I don't get the sense that whatever the kind of like celebrity, like the the way that there is now a media ecosystem that takes young female rappers, especially like Ice Spice, for example. And Ice Spice is maybe the only counter argument to Sexy Red. Even though that feels like a million years it ago. It does feel like a million years <laughs> yeah. But Ice, there's an entire media ecosystem that's ready to do stories about Ice Spice or, or news blurbs or blog posts or whatever um, that Sexy Red hasn't quite taken advantage of or hasn't quite hit Sexy Red. It does feel like the hottest mixtape that's yeah not. that's what i mean it's like most like chart like ski Yee peaked at number 17 on the hot r&b and crazy chart that's Absolutely. like that's nuts there's like a there's a certain reticence to like and maybe it's just because she's gonna wait until the album comes out and they'll sand down a couple of the edges and whatever but it's like when we're talking about this lack of sort of momentum and mainstream crossover star some and and maybe it's just that someone like sexy red doesn't need that but i also but sexy red success reminds me a lot of like let's call it like kodak black success in like the mid to late 2010s and like if you had said to me in like 2017 Someday, Kodak Black will be doing, like, editorial features in European fashion magazines. I'd have been like, are you sure, bro? Are you sure about that? 
But I was literally just on Instagram over the weekend, and Office Magazine, which is like very forward thinking, but like Office Magazine has, there's like behind the scenes footage of a Kodak black shoot from an Office Magazine. And I'm like, it took six years. It took whatever had to happen to get Kodak to a place where he was ready to do that. Maybe Sexy Red's fame is more that, where it remains ubiquitous amongst the, the faithful and the most like astute and the astute followers. But maybe that mainstream thing is something that she wants to keep at bay or it will happen eventually. Whereas I thought Megan got kind of like mainstreamed up into that very, very fast. But the music didn't always follow. I do think it's actually beneficial that that some of these young women in rap like build careers and and have hits that come on the back of these careers mm. as opposed to having one huge hit and then everything else falling somewhere under that. Like, yeah, I sure. think this is a healthier way to build a career, the yeah. Sexy Red model. Um, one thing I will say to Sexy Red's credit uh, in terms of cultural ubiquity is that there is also a Pound Town response song on these charts. There sure is. That's talking about 310 Babies, Soak City. Another satellite radio smanger. Can uh, we play, I, play like 10 clean seconds of this song? If we can, can you find, find 10 <laughs> clean seconds of this song? Right, let me see you do it, left, do it, right, 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 do it, left, do it, left. You play it on satellite radio, edited or unedited? Pretty sure it was unedited. I don't think satellite radio is edited. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's unedited. All right. So anyway, this song, who's the artist in? 310. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, three, 310 Baby? Yeah. Yeah. B-A-B-I-I. -I. Yeah. yeah. So, um... This song was getting played like every 20 minutes on on whatever normal, not Shade 4 or 5, like, you know, Hip Hop Nation mm. 44 or whatever. You know how regional hits don't feel regional anymore? Sure. Like, so depending on what they are. Yeah but, yeah, but this feels like it feels like a regional hit, but that exists to be to be sort of like mainstream. Really? Because to me, it just feels like the same as Lil Boo Thang, just like dirty. <laughs> you know, oh, it's that's like crazy. it's like kids bop, but dirty. Oh, that's crazy! I it's don't like mean... like machine generate like algo no. created. Do we know much about the artist? I do not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know much about the artist. Either. I just think if your big hit is a response song, <laughs> tell that to Roxanne Chante. Uh, different Tell era. Tell that to Roxanne Chante. <laughs> different era. Go read the 50 Rappers package. It still exists. Still exists. Online. Hey. <laughs> you like this Award song? Award winning. <laughs> <laughs> Internally. <laughs> you like this song? Um, or it's, this is a thing. It's like it's wallpaper. It's like yeah, it doesn't exist. It's I not good or bad. I would say like is not exactly the right word. Like I, I never, t here's the thing. Every time it came on, on, on the radio, I was always like, huh. What's this? But that happened. <laughs> and you knew every five, time. But yeah. like five times, I yeah. had the same exact reaction, which is like it never quite stuck with me. Okay, so that's number 26. Yeah. And this chart goes to 50. If you go, if you scroll from 26 to 50, yeah. the only artists that I haven't mentioned are Chris Brown, who are also on here. Chris Brown, Travis Scott, <laughs> uh, Ice Spice, Rick Ross, 2 Chains, Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, Young boy, it's just like Drake again. How have we gotten this far without talking about Young Big boy? X the plug? Because Young Boy is not that popular right now. Young Boy is putting out so much music. It's in a down period that none of it is like extremely popular because he's so deep in just like expunging whatever yeah. demons are inside him. But <laughs> there's two songs I want to mention on here. One because it's a because there's a challenge, there's a TikTok challenge, which continues to be a way that songs get popular, mm -hmm. and one which is essentially a reality TV rap, uh, which is social media reality rap. Oh, are we going to go there? We're That's going there? Lil Mabu and Krishan Rock, Mr. Take Ya B. Take her for a trip, fly her to New York, sign my name all on her tits. <laughs> yes, I took his lady. I like blue faces, so I took his babies. And no, this not a diss. But I know Wack 100 ain't gonna like this. This is a song about Blueface? Sure. This is like a this is a plot driven song. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> Lil Wayne could learn something from Lil Mabu about storytelling. <laughs> Yikes. Yes. Uh yes, this is um. But a I don't want to hear that. I don't this doesn't need to be on the charts. This is not music. 
No, but this is like when we were talking a few weeks ago about that era of like YouTubers making rap songs. It's yeah. like, but Lil Mabu like actually actually raps. <sighs> no, he actually raps. But like you never came put out this with Didi Osama as like, music. You went maybe you, but if you were like thirteen, like if you're thirteen and you're or invested 15, in who the mother of Blueface's children. No, but are. you're invested in like what kind of like has the most sticky scroll ability. But like if you're thirteen, how, what's how do you know the difference between this and Three Ten Baby or Yeet or Travis Scott? Like they're not they're not being presented as different. And if anything, this is the song that you probably know better than any of those other songs. It's also like one minute and 43 seconds or something, right? <laughs> Which is exactly as long as it needs to be. Um, I mean, look, it, it it exists. Look, Mabu is someone who wrote a song, assuming that it's written. I mean, he wrote someone it. wrote it. Understanding that there is a four bar window in which to create a viral challenge or a dance on TikTok. Take your bitch, take her for a trip. Oh, I didn't even know this one had a dance. Yeah. Oh, oh that's what I'm doing. Oh. That was the move. I don't what know that the was. dance. I don't know the dance. I blocked this from my algo. <laughs> Those lines, much like the first lines of the Jack Harlow song, uh, are designed to have someone apply a dance to it. And it's been interesting over the last, I mean, it's kind of over now, I think, but like, let's say three or four weeks as people have like refined what the quote unquote dance is, you know, figuring it out, like kind of in group, mm -hmm. group workshopping mm -hmm. over TikTok. Um, but th that's what that song exists for. That song exists so that all those people on TikTok can improvise the dance and figure out what it is. And then you saw he was on stage at the garden with 5 EO, go into that. 15,000 people absolutely losing it. That is, that's it right now. That's the stardom. Wow. Yeah. Dark. Uh, and then you get a song like Surround Sound by Jid, 21 Savage, Baby Tate. This is oh, a song. That's the one that. That's, that's the TikTok challenge that I was talking okay. about. Yeah. So this Which, one. to be fair, we talked about this the other day. Like I, this one had missed you, you didn't know this Totally one. So this me. is, And this is the problem with contemporary rap stardom. Two people whose job it is. To pay attention to this stuff. Sometimes it just misses you. You yeah. can only pay attention to so much. And what, however your feed is curated. Like I was telling you, we're going to get to this. But like all I've been doing for the past three weeks is reading tweets about Caribou. You didn't even know who Caribou was. Yeah, sure. It's like, again, this is our jobs. And mm -hmm. this is where we're at. This is a song, this Jid song that came out of nowhere. It had been out like a year, two years. Who knows? I don't mm -hmm. know. He's he's from Atlanta. He signed mm -hmm. to Dreamville. He's a yeah. J. Cole guy mm -hmm. uh and then all of a sudden people started taping their iphones on the ceiling crazy and dancing under them to this jid song which led to some great tweets which is like why are you throwing ass to kendrick lamar because <laughs> jid may or may not sound a little bit like kendrick lamar sometimes uh but people have also gotten quite creative with this like i thought the meme was to show your body from a bird's eye view mm -hmm. but some people have made it much more family friendly. <laughs> uh, there's like people dancing around in circles, like construction workers with like a bodega cat. You know, there's some some nice versions of this. And then there's the joke versions where it looks like a girl is about to twerk to it and then it cuts to like a preacher or something saying you should find Jesus. Push the fucking pack off of the porch or break a pound down. Get the scrap if it happened to blow. It makes a round sounds. Pussy cat on my lap. Push it back and go to town now. Putting rap on my back and I'm black and stacking crowns. So, you know, I don't know. But like this song, is this is this, is this a good rap song? I don't know. It's a good rap song. Outside of the context of everything you just described? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's it's not a song that I think would have stuck around in any other Without context. Without a challenge. Yeah, and also, like, you kind of wonder... Without the phone on the ceiling challenge. But also, like, why is this song the right soundtrack to that challenge? No idea. Like, the arbitrariness of the relationship between the song and the challenge. Like, that's something that I think... But that goes back to Black Beatles. It's, like, no, nothing no, about course. the, like... No, no, of course, but I think that's, like... I, I think people, whoever's are, whoever is still trying to game TikTok... Yeah. Like, that's actually the hardest part. The hardest part, it's not like, damn, I wish we had a catchy hook. Like, any, you know, anything could be a catchy hook, yeah. which is what we've learned over, like, three years of TikTok trends. Pretty much anything can go. So it's not so much about the music itself. It's how do you stick an unexpected video challenge 
onto an audio thing that maybe, like the Mabu thing is designed for that, but the Jid thing is not designed for that. So whoever figured that out, uh, whether they were paid by the label or not, kudos to them. I agree. Okay, the other person who's on this chart kind of a lot, despite having, I would say, a weak year, is Travis Scott. Okay. Uh, Fiend yeah. is the other big Travis Scott song of the moment, the one with the cool Playboy Cardi verse. Crazy shot, have a Henny deep in. She not Henny sing. She just trying to go. Fiend, 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 my main Travis Scott input this year are TikToks of people being like, I can't believe how cheap Travis Scott tickets are. You've seen these? Yes. I'm on SeatGeek right now, and look how cheap these tickets are. For Travis Scott's first show of his Circus Maximus tour, it's looking as cheap as 10 bucks. Um, so something's going on with the tour. I don't totally understand it. We'll get Cesario on it. Uh, I guess resellers bought a lot of tickets, and demand was not what it seemed to be, allegedly. I, you know, don't sue me. Uh, and now, you know, two days before the show, three days before, before the show, two hours before the show, you want a pretty decent Travis Scott ticket, you could probably get it in secondary markets at least for $10. Or tertiary or markets. This is something we've seen with rap tours over the last 12 months or so where like there was this huge demand coming out of the pandemic yeah ticket prices were insane you mm -hmm. know stuff like the drake and 21 savage tour and then rappers like Lil baby or Lil dirk or travis scott like they've had to fight back a lot online to be like look how crowded my show is because there because there are these screenshots that go viral of like you know you're in delaware and you want to see travis scott and like you Here's said tickets like are like 100 11 tickets bucks. for 10 bucks yeah, yeah. Mm. uh do you think that that is part of this moment of sort of like where is the center of rap music and what are we doing yeah i also think that um travis specifically um Rod Wave's a slightly different proposition to me, but Travis specifically, obviously here's a person who's coming off the Astroworld tragedy who has to re-solidify himself as not just a live performer where it's safe to go, but who is also viable. There's a bis business is on the line here because people want, if, if Travis can't fill an arena, that the entire proposition falls out the bottom. Um, and so I think some of it is that. I also think, okay, is Travis Scott a popular rapper? Is Travis Scott a rapper? Like, this is something I was grappling with a lot over the last few days. He's a merch dealer. He's a merch dealer. I, I think he's an EDM artist. Like, I think EDM is not, like, a term that I use. Like, it's, like, obviously, like, a fake term that became a real term. But as I was listening to the Travis songs that are on the charts and on Rap Caviar and then went back to listen to some other stuff, you know, it's an album I've heard. I, I don't, this is not the best Travis Scott album at all, but. You don't love Utopia? <laughs> sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I'm just imagining who that guy is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> it's like the guy, there was like some, uh, I forget the TikTok where they uh, interview someone who has like the Cactus Jack logo tattooed on him. Right. Like that guy, like breaking through the door right now. Like, you don't love Utopia. <laughs> One time I called out a guy for wearing a Houston Astros hat in New York. This was right after the cheating scandal. Don't worry about it. Uh, I was like, I was like, oh, like. I'm gonna wear that in like a, a rando in a New York bar. Yeah, yeah. I, like I don't like the Astros. This was, a, this was a moment where this was acceptable, and he was like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." And I was like, "Your hat." And he's like, "Oh, it's a Travis Scott hat." I was like, it's worse. No, it's a Houston Astros. It's actually hat. worse. That, that's actually like a war. That's the worst answer you can get. Um, anyway, you were talking about how Travis Scott sounds. Can I also just say apologies to Bun B for the Astros slander? <laughs> if you're watching, apologies. I'm sorry. I can't. Bun B can't. knows the Astros cheated. I just can't. Let's stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I was listening, trying to listen to Utopia with a different ear than I listened to it when it came out. Travis Scott is a, let's not call him a rapper right now. Travis Scott is an artist who is, whose primary contribution slash weaponry is sound and texture and the way that he has deployed different sonic frequencies and 
like burrs and and beat switches and low ends and so on and so forth. That to me is actually what Travis Scott is really useful for. Um, not Human use- Pinterest, would you say? What's that? Human Pinterest. Uh, someone has said, yes. <laughs> but to me, that is the thing that he's excelling at. And as we're going to talk about a little bit later, helping to set into motion an entire micro generation or multiple micro generations of artists who see that as what hip hop is supposed to do. Not rapping or bars or whatever or ta- like not about vocals, not even not about certainly not about content, maybe about vocal texture a little bit. But the Utopia record to me is a collection of rumbles. It's like um, I mean, this is like extremely random and abstract, but like you know about these like car speaker competitions. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Where it's like just like low tones and yeah. da da da. And there's like occasional albums of that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's it's sort of almost in that vein of thing where like if you just play the first 10 seconds of any of these songs or if, if the album was just the first 10 seconds of the song, you'd get 90% of the information that you need to get about Travis Scott. And I think his success set into motion almost everything we're probably going to talk about for the rest of the episode. Yeah, so that's why I think Fiend is such an interesting record in this regard. One, mm-hmm. it's with Playboy Cardi, and it sort of joins their two yes. versions of what we might call rage music. Parent and child. And the way, meh, like cousin and cousin. Okay. You think Travis Scott is the father of Playboy Cardi? Uncle and nephew. How about that? Is Travis Scott the uncle? Yes. Or is Playboy Cardi the... He's like one of those uncles that's actually younger than the nephew. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but so what they're doing with Fiend Live is is Travis is playing it like over and over and over again, Mm -hmm. which as some sort of like endurance test, like mosh pit challenge whatever which like it makes sense that this is the song that he's doing it for and it makes sense that he's doing that yeah. because it's not like oh no we have to get to you know my third verse on whatever la- whatever mm-hmm. deep cut it's like no we should just find the most like hell raising part of my catalog which and is, just again do it over and over mm-hmm. again i mean we should watch a little bit of travis doing that live of trying to trying to make fiend times 10 a thing this would be a really good thing if we did like a quick cut to the set but like all the chairs were tough and all the chairs were like <laughs> over toppled and just like the mics were like thrown against the wall okay travis playboy cardi yeet remember yeet big rapper for a time yeah yeah uh influential rapper like extremely influential like hit at the exact right moment in the pandemic where I think people were locked in and just sort of being like, what's a new thing? And like all of a sudden there was just all this energy coalesced around Yeet. And Yeet is someone who I think took the kind of Cardi blueprint, deepened it, made it a little bit more like less gothic and more theatrical and maybe even a little bit more fun. And then that becomes a thing that an entire kind of like one or two generations after that run with a lot of the music that, you know, we're going to talk about kind of like rage 3.0 or just noise rap or whatever, you know, whatever our friends at Nobels are talking about. Yeah. Go to that website. Yeah. Go to Google Nobels. Nobels. Um, Read about some underground rap music. It's great stuff. Um, But uh, a lot of that just feels like started with eat. Yes. And with like, Benny X and working on dying and yeah, yeah, producer like, group. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but again, yeah, it's I texture, think it's texture rap. It's texture rap. And I do think we're in this interesting place where the undergrounds, however you want to use that term, have really splintered, right? You have, you're thinking of the rap underground right now. Maybe you're talking about like Earl and Alchemist and Mike and Navy Blue. I don't know. Like maybe you're talking about like, that underground like larry june yeah larry june right people like this armand hammer you know yeah. like people that i like i'm sure there are people listening to this episode like ripping when like, are they gonna yeah and they're billy like billy woods yeah and they're like billy like rap is in a great place like billy woods you know which like fine like yes if you're into <laughs> like they're 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 not the travis scott guy but they're no, similar they're the shade, to the travis are, scott and guy. in many ways i think it is sort of like shade four or five with a phd yeah like, or young shit yeah. four or five 
Right, but but sort of like the kind of like I grew up on that, but like here's the like lightly refined artistic version of it. Which yeah. cool. Okay, then you have like the drill underground, which has anyone mentioned Shade Four or Five this much in <laughs> contemporary rap criticism in the last ten years? Give us a show. We can syndicate deluxe on Shade Four. Actually, or five. like low key, not a terrible idea. Call us. Yeah, yeah. seriously, not a terrible. Uh, idea. Can you imagine if that's our come up? <laughs> then there's there's the drill scenes. Across the entire world. Of course. Continuing to run into the ceiling of cr- criminal. Scabrousness. Yeah, and well, also, I mean, oh, like. Sonic scabrousness and also just. Yeah, yeah. like mm-hmm. like problems with the law uh, mm-hmm. and, and fear of problems with the law. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is self-contained sort of by, by nature of yeah. what's going on. Although we talked about this a little bit uh, be- before we taped, but the. Uh, Cash Cobain, the Cash Cobain, rapping Andre a little flip. bit on Andre three thousand. Like that's a nice, that's a that's a nice moment of um, sexy drill, plus Andre three thousand flute music. We listen to a, a second of that. Just before we go on, while you're mentioning the Cash Cobain thing, like I'm actually been pretty surprised that we haven't seen a bunch of rappers like actually proactively try to rap on these Andre 3000 songs. Uh, there's a good would have been a good long weekend to do that. I mean, seriously. Uh, so there was a good tweet by um, Gene Doe, Gene Doe Music, uh, who says, "Y'all think Andre 3000 gonna be mad when I put a 64 bar verse on one of these flute songs?" I don't think so. We're waiting. Yeah. No, and also, like, just to circle it up, show Andre 3000 what you can do. So you can only rap on these beats if you're over 40. Is that what you're saying? Or what? I don't know how old this person is. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Anyway, the third sort of segment of what I think of when I think of underground hip hop at the moment is what we were getting at. This sort of... I'm Rage. never going to forget you doing like this about <laughs> Arm and Hammer. I'm never going to forget it, it was a, I was inhabiting a character. You really were. <laughs> <laughs> There's this Rage 3.0 yeah. noise rap stuff. We it, mentioned Nobel's legitimately good website for covering mm-hmm. yeah, what's yeah. happening beneath Rap Caviar and the Billboard yes. rap chart that we just read off of. They have a new column uh, that's Mono and Milan. The future of rap is noisy as hell. Yes. And like I clicked through some of these SoundCloud links. <laughs> Man, it is noisy as hell. It sure is. And somehow we both were landed. We both landed on the same guy. The future of rap. Yes. Uh, don't don't quote the future no, of rap. I mean, fine. Just, quote uh, it. Whatever. But then you have to quote all this part too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, so we both um, uh, we both landed on the same guy who is Netspend. <laughs> yes, the same child who is Netspend. Uh, yes, I don't know how old Netspend is. Uh, so Netspend, uh, has had a bunch of like viral TikTok snippets over the last few months. Uh, I spent a long car ride this weekend, like playing the whole catalog and also like Netspend radio, which is just like, I mean, some algorithmically generated, if you like R-I-Y-L type stuff. Um, Netspend I think is really good. Uh, but it sounds strong. You should come out strong. Yeah. No, pro I think it's Netspend. Good. Yeah, yeah, pro Netspend. This is like to be clear, this is like a skinny white teenager. Yes. Who uh, sure. Uh yeah, who who has gone viral both for his music and for people being like, Are we sure we wanna let rap music be this? Be this. Right. Well, if you're Armand Hammer type, like this seems t- <laughs> this must be like the apocalypse. Yeah. But I also think, like, in these, like, whatever we're going to call it, Rage 3.0 circle, like, this, nothing unusual about this in that context. Right. And there's a little um, bit of hyper pop here. There's some yeah, gexiness to yeah, this Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and also, like, to go back to what I was saying about Travis, and I think this is where Travis into gex, into hyper pop, the fact that it's textural actually I, forgives is maybe the wrong word, but it essentially forgives a whole bunch of like who knows what they're talking about, you know, and whether the vocal te- the vocal content and subject matter, who knows. Um, and when I was going through, eventually we'll we'll talk a little bit more. But when I was going through the sort of like radio station, there's actually stuff that came up that was like far more clean and melodic and sort of like took some influence from this world, but like kind of like rescued it a little bit and like put a little bit of sunshine on it. Um, but Netspend, I think, is good. 
And I think it's like we're also overlooking SoundCloud 1.0, although I guess technically it would be 2.0 if you're a Sash Hollow Water Boys era fan. But like Peep, X, and like the particular ways in which melody and distortion were kind of like yanked into hip hop in that era. This is, it's so striking because I remember thinking even in like early Juice World, just being like, it's crazy that people are taking that stuff for granted. Like that's the starting point. And now it's like you have an entire micro scenes that just never lived in a time where Peep and Uzi weren't influential artists. And Cardi. And, the, and, Cardi, and they're the sure. only influential artists yeah. to a lot of these kids. Yeah. Um, and yet they're taking it in like pretty extreme abstract direction. You mentioned some of it is quite poppy and melodic. And then there's stuff like there's this Xavier So based song, Upper mm-hmm. West, that oh, I played yeah. for you before we started, which like just we're just going to play a little Wait, bit. We of haven't that. even played a Nets Ben song. All right. Play, play that. This is a 51 second song, and this is what it sounds like. <laughs> so, Xavier So Based is in the, the crew. second viral yep. clip of Netspend dancing on stage, where someone was like, This is going to be a legendary video in a few years. And, like, yeah. LOL, but, but like, like sure. yes, yes, I think so. Probably. Uh, Yes. So yes. where are you at with Nets Ben? What's what what if if you were going to introduce <laughs> a new listener to Nets Ben and you didn't want to play the video, the controversial video where he's flexing with money in his parents' bathroom, what would you play them? That's what we're going to do with snacks. Yeah, we're going like to do snacks, snacks sleeve. Snacks in their parents' bathrooms. <laughs> um okay, so the most recent one is drink drink drink. <laughs> okay. But that's actually not the one. I, I kind of want to play a different one, which is funny, uh, but it's all one word. F fun. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I is your song of the week. I feel like are these songs of the week? Is that yeah, what we're doing? Ish. Okay. Let's say this is song of the week. But I also want to talk about a couple other things from this universe. But this can be the song of the week. This is Netspend. Funny. <laughs> As I was mentioning a minute ago, when I was going through the sort of algorithmically generated pathway, it was sending me over and over again to, to a kid called Evils, who I think now is goes by Jadis. And then there's also music on Spotify by Jadis Archive. So we're now like, over the course of like 12 months, it's got three different artist names. That's lore, baby. That is absolutely like who else was to, who's doing that besides like Detroit techno artists? Like, like Lil the B was doing, you know, Lil right. B was doing something like that for a time. Um, so to me, the evils stuff, which appears to be the retired moniker, uh, was the most interesting blend of like pure melody, but also like still pulling stuff. No idea if this person's in actual dialogue with Netsmen and. But according to your fresh boy, fresh boy swag and Xavier, so like you know Samasan. Like I don't know if it's all that or if it's a totally different kid. Anyway, um, there's a bunch of good evil songs. I'm actually low key surprised. Like this seems like a person who could write pop hits someday, like an actual, like if I was like a low to mid-level a r like this is the person I'd be throwing in the studio with like Tate McRae. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to Tate come McRae. Come back to Tate McRae. Um, so this is, let's play, this is Be Like Me by Evils. Think I put a spell on his bitch. Now her boyfriend wanna be like me. Now her boyfriend wanna be like me. Just like me. Just like me. Now her boyfriend wanna be like me. It's not necessarily one of the most melodic songs, but it's it it kind of captures the full scope of what I think this person does. Also, there's a good record uh called Jodeci, uh under the Jadis archive name, which I also really like. So anyway, that's my rap underground. Uh, <laughs> I, I do miss, like, I do miss the part of my career when, like, this is all I cared about. Like, this is the only type stuff, and I'd just be, like, digging it up all day long. That's why I'm glad, like, Nobels exists. That's why I'm glad um, 
uh, Underground Sound, which does like has like a video series where they like interview a bunch of these guys and makes you feel old. I, first of all, that's what Andre three thousand. I'm not listening to the Andre three thousand flute album. I'm not that old. No, it makes me go listen to them. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your youth struggles. Okay, so I have a few bright spots uh, mm-hmm. uh, in hip hop, and they are you know. Up, up my alley, but new enough. Yeah. Um, these are two young women from Atlanta. Yeah. Rapping both together and apart. I mentioned earlier Caribou. Yeah. She's the uh, young woman in Yachty's new crew called Concrete Boys. Yeah. Some of us are old enough to remember Cody Shane, the original girl in Yachty's uh, crew. In, also in the, um, on the sail uh, on the sailing team. Also, when I on the sailing sailing team, well, I need some sailing team merch. Uh, I, have, I have I have a good. You have the team nautica, shirt. like the actual nautica stuff or the old sailing. No, team but merch? I was with Yachty at the nautica uh, premiere at Urban Outfitters, and I was I was at Icebox one of the days that Yachty came in to work on like a Concrete Boys chain. So much Yachty lore. Yeah. Anyway, Yachty has Call Yachty's new crew, history. Concrete Boys, Caribou. She sort of made her big debut uh, on their on the radar freestyle. Yep. Uh, she had had a song out earlier this year. Had some good buzz on YouTube called "Box the 40, which is pretty good. Um, and is then she the one that's also in the TikTok videos. There's like yeah, some... she was on the podcast recently. Yeah. Okay. That's. I think I knew her through that before. This. You knew her through pods instead of music. That's where we're at in rap that music. Just, just like us. Uh, yes. Um, you never know our day jobs. There's another girl uh, in Atlanta right now, Anicia. Same thing. She had a song called BRB. She has a really like laconic, deep, slow flow that is very punchy. Yeah. Um, and Caribou, same thing. Sort of like lax, laid back, very Detroit via atlanta mm-hmm. uh sort of punch in bars um they're both chill yeah. uh and they have a song together called splash brothers uh which i like a lot that came out a couple weeks ago step me to come correct eat, eat. all this ice around my neck feel like i'm anemic go, go, go. they keep pressing me go. to drop i'm trying to be strategic go, go. i might tell you that i love you i don't really mean it you've been blowing up my phone for weeks act like i ain't see it you act like i ain't see it get your number then delete it bitches on my bumper but i'm getting money i'm complete i'm complete when i eat bone appetite i get money in my sleep um but caribou put out her sort of follow-up single um, and this is my actual song of the week. It's called Running Late. Um, and it's a little bit emo. It's a little bit hard. Uh, and yeah, she just, I think she has a future. She started as Yachty's assistant and now yeah, she is rapping. Hear it in my music. Mama scared for me to get a gun, cause she know I'ma use it. Floating off a of rock, seeing a bar, feel so therapeutic. Want me to stop taking all these drugs? She hate how I abuse. John, I have a big snack for you this week. I will say, I have to confess, I have been avoiding this snack. This has been sitting in the snack pile for almost as long as we've been doing this show. I have been avoiding it. I'm scared of it. I'm genuinely scared of it. Like, what's the equivalent of spice? Like, the lactate for spice. Like, you have <laughs> yeah, lactate first. I need that. You need antacid specifically for collab beef jerky, which is what this is. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm so stressed. This is Jack Link's beef jerky. <laughs> Collaboration with Doritos. Spicy sweet chili flavor. This is the purple bag of Doritos, which I don't think people have really clocked this. Purple has become the third bag of Doritos. Yeah, it's just there. It's just, it's there, just now. there with the it's blue and just, the red. It's literally just there now. Yeah, uh, and, and I call it Chinese food flavored. It tastes like really good Chinese food. Mm-hmm. It's like a General Tso's chicken flavored Dorito, basically. I go for the sweet spicy chili mm-hmm. like quite often, just as like a just around the house snack. Yeah, sure. I bet you do not. I don't. Uh, <laughs> but it is just there. Yeah. Like, that is the striking It's thing. not an alt flavor anymore. No, It's no. a main flavor. I think the first couple times I saw it, I was like, oh, this will go away. But now it's just always at the supermarket. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this oh, is Jesus. Doritos so, I'm so branded beef jerky. I'm so stressed. You like beef jerky in general? Yeah. 
Oh. You like like a dry, like a real beef jerky, no, like that you, you know, get at like a a place that, like in the south. You know, no, like, like one of those homemade. like moisty ones. No, no, no. But you know what I like is the crave beef jerky. That's the black cherry flavor. Oh, you like like startup beef jerky? No, nah, but here's the thing. <laughs> Once I hit Copacker era, like actually fell off. Oh my gosh, you're <laughs> you're gonna love this. I'm taking the fillet <laughs> of this beef jerky. <laughs> This is a big piece of Doritos beef jerky. Ah, it smells. Um, maybe it'll be okay. I mean, it definitely has the Chinese food, mm-hmm. the sort of like. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. It's a complex flavor. It's taking me on a journey. Yeah, you said that about the 11 Madison Park nuts. And in retrospect, I'm like, that's not a real. That... <laughs> Don't you know, come up with a real word. Complex. What do you mean? We, got, we could do better. I'm, oh, you we're don't like my writers. food criticism? Yeah, we're two writers. I'm saying it starts in one place and you end up in another. And along the way, you got a few stops. What is that if not a journey? How about a roller coaster? I like it. It's not that spicy. Is, it, that is spicy. it hurting you, John? Talk to me in 20 minutes. <laughs> Mm. It's quite sweet. It's way more sweet than spicy. I haven't figured out the spice is just like a slow burn that's going to get to me at some point, but I think not. But I like that it starts sweet and then and then the sort of peppery flavor really comes through after. I don't think it really tastes that much like the Doritos. It doesn't have the sharpness of the Doritos. Yeah, if you if you gave me this blind, I would, <laughs> believe it or not, I would not be able to guess that it was a Doritos collaboration. <laughs> Go back to the lab. <laughs> yeah, I want more Dorito flavor. But I think it's a delicious beef jerky. Like, I'm getting the sweetness. I'm getting the punch of the spice. But I'm not getting actual the meat flavor. Saying it's all flavor and no beef. It does feel that way. I mean, obviously not texturally, but in terms of, like, journey, as it were. I would eat the whole pack. Yeah. It's an it, 8 out of 10 for me. It is a touch... Like for me, it's a touch spicy, but I can, <laughs> but I can acknowledge that it's not actually spicy. Um, I think it's good. I'm gonna go. Would you say eight? Yeah, I think that's right. We agree. Yeah, it's I think rare. I maybe even would go a tiny bit higher. Wow. to be honest, you're in an eight five. Yeah, or like I might a strong go, eight. It's like eight two, but like only on some days <laughs> because I'm gonna have days where like I can't handle this. Right, but like on a day when I can handle this, yeah, eight point two. That's it. Uh, if you like net spend, try Jack Link's Doritos Spicy Sweet Chili <laughs> flavor. Um, that is our show. What a special thing. Um, every podcast ever is at nytimes.com slash podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash podcast. All the episodes with me and Joe are right here. And subscribe to podcast audio edition anywhere you get your audio content at Spotify, Apple Music, also YouTube, etc. Um, tinyurl.com slash podcast discord or slash podcast Facebook. That's where you can ask us questions, talk to other folks. Uh, that's the Discord and the Facebook. Make but friends, find love. That are there any marriages? Not yet, but I, I can feel it coming. If you are gonna have a podcast marriage, we'll come. We'll officiate it. I would love to officiate. Like that's that's standing offer? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, standing offer. Um, our senior producer is Sawyer Roque. Our editor is Jamie Heffitz. Uh, special thanks, as always, to Karen Gans, Pedro Rosado, Nell Galogli, Pat Gunther, Leslie Davis. We'll be back next week.